you'd be just uh, from my side welcome to this call about the shared module prototype or pilot that's been going that's been delivered over the recent uh, weeks and months the title of which is globally responsible leadership for sustainable transformation so quite a mouthful but i'm sure you would agree that there's a huge amount of work to be done in this regard so so we're joined on the call today by a number of the partners and associates that have been driving the pilot initiative as well as some representatives from partner and associate institutions that are interested in either starting their own similar joint module or perhaps joining a future intake if possible. The idea of today's gathering is simply to reflect on what we've learned over the recent weeks and months about, uh, uh, about running such a shared program and then to start looking ahead at what might be required to get something similar off the ground, either on a more permanent basis or, again, perhaps in a more experimental kind of state. So I am, I wanted to suggest, I don't know whether anyone's been able to access the little shared agenda, but I will just post the link again on the chat if you want to open it directly. And just for a few moments, I will share my screen so that, so that you, for those of you who are not able to access that, so that we can just have a quick look at, at the suggested agenda um, for today's meeting. You're all very welcome, which is the first point. We'll do some brief introductions right uh, just in a moment. And then we'll have a short discussion that provides an overview of the initiative and some of the pilot modules that, that form part of it. Based on, based on an earlier discussion that I had with Jeff Tees, we figured that there were that there were a number of categories or, or headings for discussion. And so when we reflect on the learning from this pilot initiative, we look at those various items, positioning, student engagement, course content, and the like. And then we can move to considering timelines for the next intake, as well as look at the possibility of forming additional or parallel pods or coalitions and then any other business. So it's a fairly open meeting. I have not prepared a, a, a full blast presentation with all the answers. This is an opportunity for those who've been taking part in, in, in the pilot initiative to reflect on what we've learned, what worked, what didn't work, what will we do differently? What do we want to retain, et cetera? So this is just a way of, of structuring that. Okay, I see we've been joined now by a few more people. I just want to double check. Uh, there's someone joining by phone. If you could maybe just identify yourself so we know who you are. Yes, Don, it's Lisa. Can you hear me? Oh, hi, Lisa. Welcome. Hi, I sent you an email or a email because it turns out I was using the meeting passcode instead of the meeting ID, and so I couldn't get in. So that's why I'm late. But I discovered the error of my ways, and I am here mostly as a listener because. I believe that Mason very much wants to be part of round two. Wonderful. Thanks, Lisa. So that's um, Lisa Grinch-Pimble from George Mason University. And uh, thanks so much, Lisa, for joining us. Um, so Absolutely. let's maybe start. So, since we've now heard from at least one person, maybe we can just do a very quick round of introductions, just your name and your affiliation, just so we know who all's on the call, because I know that you don't necessarily all know each other. And... Uh, I'm going to suggest that you just, when you're ready, just pop and just tell us who you are and your affiliation. I'm Wayne Visser and I'm from Antwerp Management School. John Knights, Chairman of Leadership Global. Philip O'Regan from Kemi Business School in Ireland. And Sheila Killian, also from Kemi Business School in Ireland. Hi, my name is Alicia. Uh, sorry, Helen. I'm from Ishkte Business School in Lisbon. Helena Gonçalves from Catolica Porto Business School. 
Hi, I'm Richard Welford from Sassin School of Management in Bangkok. Great. Travis Maynard from Colorado State University. Jeff Thies, Loyola Marymount, Los Angeles, California. I'm Emma Chapman and I'm from Leadership as well in London, uh, UK, sorry. <laughs> I'm Julie Cho. I'm with the University of Stellenbosch Business School in near Cape Town, South Africa. Right. Let me see if we heard from everyone. And then Otti, I think, has also joined us. Hello there. And I'm sorry I'm in traffic here at the moment. It's loud. Um, I'm joining from London, representing myself and the endeavor to create good leadership in the world. Nice to meet you all. Thanks. Otti, of course, being, being one of our independent associates. And Otti, welcome to welcome at the meeting today as well. So we are uh, Dima, I think. Uh, yeah, Dima. Name. My name oh, is Dima Jamali. Dima. There we go. Dima's back Dean online. <laughs> no problem. Dima Jamali, and I'm the dean of the College of Business at the University of Sharjah in the UAE. Wonderful. Current. Thanks, Dima. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, I, you you were on the phone earlier when I when I. Yes, yes, that's up. right. That's right. I Sorry about up. that. Okay. No so I think just then in terms of giving a brief overview, I will I will kick off. And then any of those who's been who's been taking part and contributing to the shared module is welcome to chip in. In fact, when we get to the modules, it might be useful just to get a very quick uh, snapshot from, from each of our contributors. So what maybe just some context. What happened was I think as part of the as part of the dean's cohort. Actually, already a number of years ago, the idea came about to, to collaborate on, on programs. And some of the discussion was around student exchange programs as well. But it, it, I, I guess it was felt that the, that the simplest and, and most straightforward way of, of initiating this type of collaboration would be to offer a shared and joint module. I know um, that the dean at Antwerp and at originally at Grossman School of Business were in discussion. Wayne, if I remember correctly, that was one of the very early kind of discussions around this. And then, and then a kind of a nucleus formed around LMU, Antwerp, and a few others that said, "Okay, let's try this." So this is very much a story of a coalition of the willing. We didn't know exactly how it was going to work out. We didn't have any of the necessary infrastructure. We didn't do a huge amount of planning, to be perfectly honest, or, but there was a very strong commitment to making it work. So obviously the, the program has a focus on sustainability initiatives. It is team taught. So the seven institutions each contributed a component or a module to the program. And of course, it also enabled the global cohort of students, which we enrolled roughly 50, I think not the, the entire cohort didn't complete the course, but we did have enrollment of roughly 50 students. They also participated in integrated group projects, which we'll say a little bit more about uh, later on. The course is presented both live and asynchronously, and of course is supported by the GRI. And I think maybe just to give us a, 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 a quick kind of snapshot of the course content, and its focus. I'm going to invite the various institutions just to each say 30 to 45 seconds on their particular component, just so we know what it covered. Again, may, maybe Wayne, if you can start, um, and then I'll just call out the names. Sure. From Antwerp Management School, we did a module on thriving, the breakthrough strategies for regenerating nature, society, and the economy. And mainly this uh, was about how we integrate systems thinking and apply it to business. Of course, it nicely lined up with my new book of the same title, but really it was uh, to get people to understand these six great transitions that we have to go through in society from breakdown to breakthrough and uh, how they can integrate uh, sustainability or our view of thriving in their organizations practically and we had a little element of leadership as well and what kind of leadership we need for 
of this kind of thriving in future. Thanks, Wayne. Maybe if you could just add, and, and the others the same, just in terms of unfair student participation in this pilot, what level of engagement, not sorry, the level, what I meant by that was whether it was executive ed or graduate, etc. Yeah. So, yeah. So we offered it as an executive ed program and we had five joining, one dropped out. So in, we ended up with four from our side going on. I think three of them uh, did all of the modules and uh, some did a few less. Four was the minimum that people had to do. Great. Thanks, Wayne. I'm going to move on to uh, Travis Maynard. Travis, if you could just give us a quick update. Sure. Uh, at Colorado State, we did a session on sustainable supply chain. My colleague, Catherine, delivered the, the session or the module. She talked about the global reach of supply chains, risks in supply chain, and how we overcome that. Uh, certainly, the sustainable aspects of it, including the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how supply chain ties into that, responsible sourcing, environmental and climate sustainability and the impacts on the supply chain, and then best practices in reporting in supply chain. So those were some of the main topics. She brought in at least one, maybe a second guest speaker from industry to talk about uh, sustainable supply chain. We ran it as a um, graduate and our graduate population and our MBA students. We started with 21, I believe, and finished with 19 from Colorado State. And maybe you could just add something briefly, Travis, about the technology that you were using, because I know that's been quite a feature. Yeah, so we're fortunate in our MBA program to have a, what we call the mosaic wall, which allows we have a fairly robust online MBA, and it allows our students to join our class synchronously from wherever in the, in the world they might be. And it was great to see all the students from across the globe, almost every entity that's involved in this shared modules across the different institutions were represented synchronously on our wall. So it made for a very interactive experience. Thanks, Travis. Okay, so moving on, Jeff, if you could maybe bring in the LMU perspective. Yeah, we chose to do a module highlighting the application of sustainability practices within an industry. And so we focused on the entertainment industry and we had participants from the industry, one called the Green Spark Group, which runs the Sustainable Production Forum. We had the designer and leader of the Green Production Guide, and then someone who was launching a nonprofit funded by the Bloomberg Philanthropy called Good Energy Stories and the incorporation of sustainability, climate issues specifically in storytelling. We also had scheduled a session highlighting the work of the elder to, from the British Academy of Film and Television, and that was to accommodate European partners that ended up being um, canceled at the last minute because of illness, but the intention was to have that be a portion of it, and we had that lined up. We offered it as a three-unit MBA course, and because of that, we required student participation in all seven of the modules, along with the group project, which we'll talk about. And we had five enrollees from LMU as part of the process of working to get student participation, we extended the invitation to some of our colleagues on the West Coast in the Jesuit um, Business School network. And so we also had a student from Santa Clara University and another from Seattle University. So we ended up with seven. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, turning to our colleagues in Limerick, I don't know who would like to just give an update there. Thanks, Sheila. Go ahead, sir. You want to go ahead, Philip, or will I? I <laughs> Philip and I did some work on, did a module on um, accounting and accountability for sustainability, which is an area we've been both working on for a couple of decades now. 
So it covered accounting for the different aspects of sustainability, what it means to be accounting, the idea of accounting as a language, the challenge of standards, the current confusing landscape. What else did we have in there, Philip? What am I missing? Well, I think we did a fairly comprehensive review of the kind of broad reporting developments over the last few years, which which was quite topical for students because it's quite, that area is quite active. The bit I want to remark on, take my prompt a bit from what Jeff said, uh, we did ours from an executive education perspective. I think we had four students, Sheila. What struck me was there was no downside to having students in the class from executive education, from other grades of learning, other types of input. It was really interesting. It was one of the things I was concerned about, that there might be a bit a division within the class dynamics on those bases. Sheila, I, it didn't seem to happen. No, it didn't. It worked well because we yeah. had, we, it was quite interactive and we had breakout groups which were mixed yeah. and, and they got on well. We found it interesting. We had, as Philip said, four students. Um, three of them took the group project plus four modules and one took the group project plus five modules. And we use Zoom for the synchronous session. Very good. Thanks. Turning to Richard in, uh, at Sassine. Sure. Thanks, John. So I did a module on shared value and social innovation which really emphasised the need to embed sustainability within core business rather than an add-on. It was very much about leveraging the assets and expertise of business rather than things like philanthropy. So a lot of emphasis on innovation and developing business models that have purpose, that are creative, and developing sort of models that can demonstrate impact. Lots of examples and cases of profitable businesses that do have significant social and environmental impacts. We, at Sassin, for various reasons that I won't go into, we didn't actually recruit our own students this time, but we were still very happy to contribute. The idea in the future is that we'll run this as an executive education uh, program and uh, bring in those types of students in the future. Thanks, Richard. And, and again, thanks to Sassim for uh, contributing, uh, even though you weren't in a position this round to, to recruit students. So that's much appreciated. Uh, moving to, uh, to Portugal, to Católica Porto. Helena, I'm glad you're on the call. Hi, thank you. Uh, and our, our module was uh, about cross-sex and partnership for impact. The teacher was uh, Raquel Campos Franco. It's not me. Our, the students will deepen in the model their knowledge of the potential of partnership in the develop, development and implementation, implementation of solutions for challenging social and environment problems with a lot of real uh, cases about the, all the world. Non-profit organizations, among them foundations and the public sector may bring to partnership will company its knowledge and resources that uh, uh, complement each other. Uh, the particular, particular case of social entrepreneurship will, uh, will was present and, and learning was focused in grounded in real case discussions. We have uh, 10 students, all from a business school, from executive education, five students uh, was from companies, and five, five students was alumni from, from business school. I think it's all. It's all. Thanks, Elena. Wrapping up, I I think that is John Knights. John, if you can maybe just give us a quick summary from your side. Yeah, sure. So our module was transpersonal leadership, which was focused on how an individual needs to develop themselves in the context of leadership on a basis of 
emotional intelligence and values. <clears throat> and so what we did was we, we, they had a text to read that gave them an overview of the transpersonal leadership journey and also e-learning that focused on emotional intelligence and leadership styles. We then <clears throat> had the live session, which uh, was very interactive. We had 11 people attending live, although I think there were, I don't know, 30 odd people actually participated in the module, but uh, many of them were asynchronous and so would have watched the recording of the live session. I guess that was similar for a lot of people. And uh, basically we focused on, during that session, on asking individuals to discuss their main learnings about leadership from the module, what they've learned about themselves in the context of leadership, and what they thought think is the role in sustainable transformation of leadership styles and which are the most important to achieve this. And I think that was, it was a very interesting um, exercise. Uh, we also had a short interview with a uh, CEO of Jacobs Foundation, which is one of the largest philanthropic uh, foundations in the world. <coughs> on how they have approached co-leadership. So I think that's an overview of the program. We didn't generate any students because it was in a very short time frame. And as a commercial organization, we just weren't able to really do marketing in time. But, but we had a lot of students do the module. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. And thank you everyone just for giving a, a, a quick summary there. Now, before we move into the next part of um, today's discussion, which is gonna be more open, <laughs> I, I thought it might be useful just to give a, a very quick snapshot, at least based on, on, on the feedback that we've had in, in recent days of the interest in potentially either joining future intakes or forming a, a similar pods. We have on the call today, because we haven't heard from them now in, in detail yet, but we have George Mason University represented by Lisa, Ishtay Business School by, represented by Patricia. We have the recently rebranded University of Stellenbosch Business School with Julie joining us. Not able to join us today due to time zones, QUT, they are in the process of restructuring their exec education division, but Melissa, Melinda Edwards would like to stay um, abreast of what's happening here. And then also uh, is still interested in taking part, but not able to join us today, University of Javiskala in Finland. Uh, so as we continue to reflect on what worked, what didn't work, what needs to change, just to keep in mind that there is strong interest in either doing something similar or potentially joining future intakes if it is possible. Now, the headings that I proposed for our discussion were the positioning, marketing, and recruitment elements. I bundled that together, then student engagement and experience, then the course content, the finance and operations, and the actual principles underlying the partnership model that we have we have captured some provisional feedback. So maybe a good place to start, if I may, is since, since we've had some feedback from Porto about the student experience. Thank you so much, Helena, for, for sharing that. I'm going to put that on the screen. Um, just so uh, John, can I ask a quick question oh, uh, yes, just please, before yes. we move? Um, mm. we, we expressed interest in definitely being part of this. In fact, we wanted oh, to be part want, of I'm this. So we did yes. not put us in the slide. You did not mention our I name. Will, I will add you immediately. My apologies, Pima. Yes. I, and I have a question also. Is yes. this for the participants? And we're likely to run it more as an exec ad for us. Uh, and I wanted to ask if there is a cost associated so the students have to pay uh, uh, and how much? Because it's just to have the, the full picture. And then you can move on to the rest oh, of the okay. 
Yeah. First of all, my apologies again, Dima, for not no adding problem. Why that was entirely my oversight. So sorry about that. I know you're on the call. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> it happens to all of us. No worries. I'm not ignoring, I'm not ignoring you, I promise. No. So you were asking about the about the, the delivery. Cost. The yeah, delivery the cost. delivery and, and the cost. Okay. Let's make we can maybe start there because when we do have the finance operations, we have the so what, what was interesting is we had to figure out a way of costing this so that so that we can almost ensure that there isn't, especially in Europe, that there isn't com competition amongst the various entities for students. I'm wondering whether maybe some of our European colleagues can maybe just say a little bit about their experience of how we costed it. And, and then we can just say something about where we ended up in terms of costing Sheila, Wayne, uh, please, sure. please chip in, yeah. We basically just agreed to align so that we would all charge the same fee, so we weren't competing with each other. And the fee structure was pretty simple. It was 2,000 euro, which covered four modules and the group project, and then an additional 500 per other module. So that nice. meant that, so it was fairly straightforward. Excellent. And, and, so and, then, and then those of us who ran it in the um, four credit space within our graduate programs, we just charged what we normally charged to do that. Mm, I see. Excellent. So this money goes to whenever we charge the participants, the money goes to the university, it goes to GRLI. I'm just trying to clarify the whole picture. I'm sorry. but uh, in, in the pilot, we, ran, we were keeping things simple. And so essentially, the money that came from our students was retained by our institution. But uh, going forward, that's, we can see that that's not entirely equitable because some people do teaching on the course who don't, have not recruited students. So we're in the process of working out a financial model that involves more sharing. I see, okay, very clear. Thank you so much, thank you. By, by design at the beginning, we did not wanna begin a process where we were needing to exchange monies between the universities or the organizations participating. And that was by design for simplicity's sake, like Sheila had mentioned. I see. Okay. Thank you. Very clear. Apologies because I'm trying to catch up with all the dimensions of this to understand. Okay. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Dima. And please continue asking questions. And everyone who has uh, the experience of, of engaging with us, please continue to support responding because I don't necessarily have the answer. <laughs> <clears throat> Maybe if we dive in and, and, and pick kind of student experience as a starting point, and then this is inevitably going to lead also to, to some, of the other, um, some of the other areas. I'll, I'll just quickly put, put up on the screen what Helena and, and our colleagues at Porto shared. Helena, I don't know if you want to maybe just say a few words about, about um, the feedback that you've had, and then uh, we can also hear from others what, what type of um, feedback they've heard. You can you can do this feedback. It's 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 here, okay, John. Yes, we have a, you, you have a meeting with our students, and I refer some a lot of uh, positive aspects like this: fantastic trainer, quality of materials, new and relevant concepts, uh, good dynamics in the section great interaction between colleagues in the sections and a lot of learnings and interactions with group projects. They loved the, the group projects uh, with one exception because there are some problems in one, one group, but they loved uh, to join and, and to, to do the, the group projects. It was an extremely positive experience and they loved Post co uh, course contacts and includes uh, um, um, friendship between them. Some negative aspects and and unproven su uh, suggestions. Uh, uh, few hours they they want more hours for for sharing uh, for more space to, to sharing uh, among uh, them. Little time between models. 
because they need to, to do a, a reflection work and, and also in, in the same time, preliminary readings for the model. And this is problematic, especially for those who do all the models, the seven models that have a little time. The platform, it's, we all know it's not very, very intuitive. We need, we know there are some improvements in the platform. Probably more consistent methods uh, from professors and the, um, the some activities, uh, it's not in the platform, in the calendar of platform, and probably the, 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 the most is rethinking the, the time of the session because the difference uh, the time zones. It's, I think it's, 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 it's a, a, our main problem is uh, what uh, the time of the session. And one of the students say, and, and um, you say this, this course far exceeded my expectations, both in terms of the knowledge of sustainability that, in, that it brought me, uh, always with an orientation that is applicable to my work context and in the possibility of meeting people, teacher and students, with very different profiles and truly interested, they they love the the course. Yes. So maybe building on that, thank you so much, Helena, for getting that started. Maybe building on that, maybe we can just hear from some of the other contributors, just through the lens of the student experience because that will maybe give us also an entry point into some of the other dimensions um, that we need to be capturing some learning on. I, I thought that uh, Helena's email that she sent through, which is just read out, was spot on. I think that was generally our experience as well. The one thing that I'd perhaps add was that I think our module, live module, was particularly interactive, and some of the students who was who'd got behind with their reading, and ours was the last session, hadn't done the pre-work. I probably assuming that it was going to be repeated <laughs> during the live session, and of course it wasn't. So I think there were two or three students who were who were a little bit out of it in that. They hadn't done the pre-work, but those that had all reflected very positively. So that would be the only thing I'd add. From our side, we also picked up some positive uh, feedback. They liked the variety. They uh, liked working on the group project. They liked that we were also in touch with them fairly often, just checking in on them. I think the main downside is more around coordination so just because each of the different institutions were doing something slightly different there was some confusion that came in for example a st student saying I'm waiting for my grading and feedback on from all the modules that I took I submitted these reflection assignments and I haven't heard anything back Whereas, of course, that varies by institution and by, by, to some extent by module as well. So I think some clarity. Another one, for example, was when do I get my grades for the submission for the group project? And we haven't been clear on that. We've just been clear on when we have to do it by. But then we've said each institution figures out when they're going to feed back to the students. So I just think... It's a coordination challenge because we went quite decentralized, which had its pros, but also its cons. I think we could- One keep, thing, uh, Philip, please. Sorry, Jeff. I, I keep thinking in terms of how to sell and better sell the program in, in terms of marketing. The piece that was most consistent in what at this stage I think is only verbal feedback from students on our part was that the opportunity to work with students on an international basis 
was something that distinguished the program from most other offers that they had available to them. Uh, I, I think Helena's uh, feedback is really interesting. My, ne my next point is, not, is neither flippant nor arrogant. I think I would like to see the idea that there are differing views from lecturers and those teaching. I would like to see that framed as a positive because I think that's one thing that we can bring to it. We can credibly present this program as something where we're not trying to give a consistency of view, although there is, there is a consistency of perspective. And there is, there's room for uh, difference and differentiation on that. So uh, I, that, that's a minor point, Helena, but I think the feedback you've gathered has been extremely useful. And one thing I would, just two things, I guess. One is that in terms of the module content, we each volunteered what we wanted to offer. It, so there wasn't a master design of thematic elements that then we crafted together. But the students, at least at LMU, have really responded to the diversity of content and the mix of leadership and dimensions of practical application that's been really well received. The time zone is an issue and a challenge. It's 5.30 in the morning right now for this meeting for me, for example. And so when we were presenting this to the students, we had no expectation. I was really clear about this. You're welcome to attend the module synchronously, but I'm assuming that you will do it asynchronously in an independent study because the timing is such that it's just not very workable from a west uh, coast of the United States. So that, that became an issue. And uh, I think we're still working through that. The project teams successfully worked together. We had one, one case where there was a bit of a challenge, but for the most part, they worked really well together. And the global teams was a key benefit of their experience that they speak to. If I can just add this as a more a discussion point for us to pick up later, but I do think having the sessions recorded gave us a workaround so that people could do it to some extent asynchronously but it also created a very uneven experience because clearly those that were in the room and we designed very interactive courses got a completely different experience uh, and a much deeper richer experience i would expect than those who watched a video and just submitted a reflection paper so i think that the issue of live versus asynchronous continues to be something to to look at yes i agree with wayne yes yes and if i could just add one thing on the team project i've just graded four of them and uh, they're quite uneven in terms of how closely they work together so one team for example very clearly reviewed each other's stuff talked about it worked together whereas others obviously just carved it up at the last minute so I think we might need to, this connects to the fact that Google Classroom, it was, it was nice and freely available, but it's, it's awfully clunky. It would be nice if there were some decent kind of way of, of facilitating and encouraging more interaction at the team, because as Philip said, it's one of the key selling points for the programme. And those who did engage benefited but it was possible to go along moving from module to module, not engage, and then be taken by surprise with having the team project. You shouldn't be taken by surprise, but nonetheless, people were with having the team project to be delivered and not get that richness of experience. And I think a better platform might help, but maybe it's something for communications as well. I don't know. Yeah, let me piggyback. So our students at CSU, we're, we are still collecting survey data, which I'll talk to here in a second. But I've had some informal conversations and they really positive, enjoyed the chance to learn from experts, some of whom are on this call from around the globe on this topic, getting to interact with the students. And one indication of how positive our students were on this experience was Several of the students got up at, to Jeff's point, five in the morning to join certain calls. And I think that's, that's telling. 
So just looking quickly at the survey, I like learning from professors across the globe. A little more interactive session would have been great. And, and I was thinking about that on the call as somebody was talking is a session, and we've talked about it, a kickoff session where we try to have as many of the students there and allow them to meet all the faculty who will be teaching them later in the modules, I think would be helpful. To the extent we could have faculty from all the institutions join synchronously at the others, to Philip's point about having some, con not conflict, but having some disagreements is valuable. That could happen if the faculty were attending the other sessions. Contents were dynamic and very interesting. There was a large spread between the modules in terms of required preparation work, required prior knowledge, and amount of content covered. And so recognize this was a pilot. We were all trying to figure out how much work, how much pre-work. So there, that is a, probably a legitimate comment. The information shared in the modules was wonderful. One thing that I thought would be great if there was a way for us to read any of the executive summaries and see the presentations done by the other group, other groups, I'd love to see what they did as well. I think that's an interesting comment. So I won't read them all, but that gives you a little flavor and I'll share with those who participated in the pilot as we get more responses in the rest of this week. But our students thoroughly enjoyed, I think for the most part, there were some logistical challenges, right? We use our own learning management system, and so our students are used to that. But as, as someone mentioned, we use Google Classroom because it was a free, everybody could join type of, of tool. And there's some switching costs, right? From a student's cognitive load, they're used to their own Blackboard or Canvas or whatever they might be using, and then switching to a new tool. I think the students got used to it over time, at least ours, but it took a little bit of hand-holding to get them there from our advisors and from our faculty. But that just added a little extra burden to the team to pull that off. <clears throat> Thanks. And this will become an issue. Yeah, I'm sorry, John. Mm -hmm. This will become an issue that we'll talk about, but GRLI, John specifically, but GRLI stepped into that space of direct student contact, the need for student support, questions that were generated at times at times going to John. So the administrative relationship of GRLI to the process became an issue. One other one that was part of that is needing to design registration, recognizing GDPR compliance requirements. And so that was another way in which very early on a GRLI as a landing page and process for entry into the program became important. Yeah, I wonder if it, th thanks so much. I, I, I may just quickly come in here. The, as, as I'm li listening to some of the concerns about the platform, I, I do wonder to what extent it was perhaps the, the absence of central coordination capability and not so much the clumsiness of the platform that caused some of the, some of the discomfort. Because as far as learning management systems go, and I have been taking a look around and I'd be more than happy to hear some, suge some suggestions, but anything up from Google Classroom, leaving aside cost, is going to be more complicated. So do we look for a different platform, Canvas, whatever it may be, and, and get a license for that? Or do we, do we stick to something that is relatively simple, but with stronger support, perhaps is less dis discomforting? Sheila, maybe you have some thoughts. Yeah, I think I do. It's a bit, it's threefold. I do think Google Classroom is a little clunkier than a paid one. But I think almost any paid one would be uh, equally clunky for 90% of us because what's awkward is that it's different and anything we choose will be a little different. And I do think that better communication of 
we, that's the thing we've learned a lot in the pilot, clearer communication and, and not assuming that the students read their emails, which of course, it's what, what applies to all our other education. So I don't know why it was surprising in this one. But I think a lot of it is just, it would be resolved by clearer communication and by regular communication and more coordination. Jeff also touched on the, on the issue of GDPR. So it might just be worth quickly saying something about that. We realized quite early on that we will be sharing student data. And so we ended up following the route whereby GRI acted as the collection point for student contact information for those taking part in the global cohort or in the shared modules so that we don't end up, A, in a position where every single institution has to sign an agreement with every other institution. So we don't have seven times seven uh, different partnership agreements between the different uh, contributing institutions. But also the GRI could then ensure that we, that in terms of collecting uh, student data for access to Google Classroom, that we remain GDPR compliant and that students agree up front to sharing their information for the purposes of administering their participation in the course. In fact, in the agenda document that I sent out, I added an addendum slide for those that can access it, which is the very, very last slide where we started mapping out the kind of the student or yeah, the process whereby partners, the, in other words, the academic institutions enroll the students in their program and determine which of the modules they'll take. And then from there, uh, collect the, 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 the address that the, that the student will use to access Google Classroom and give them a link to a GRI form where they complete the data privacy requirements. And once they've completed the data privacy requirements, the GRI can then contact the student for the purpose of giving them access to Google Classroom. So that was how we ended up uh, organizing that. And I think we've learned quite a bit now about the codes. For instance, we set up a separate classroom for the, for the staff itself, a separate classroom for the assessment and the group project. And so we've now gone through a first round of figuring out how that might work. I just want to briefly come back before we touch on some of the other topics. Dima, you were also asking about the fees. So there was a kind of a set fee that was agreed amongst those that, that charged for access to the course. What we will most definitely need in the next round is for a, a, an amount per institution. And we calculated it, roughly speaking, at somewhere between 700 and 1,000 euros per institution that's contributing. Just correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong. I know, John Knights, you were kind of a little bit closer to the numbers. But we said that for the duration of, of the next module, any of the institutions that takes part will contribute somewhere between 700 and 1,000 euros to the GRI in order for us to create central capacity. So that gives us somewhere in the region of, of 45,000 euros, which allows us to create some additional capacity during the time in which this particular course needs to be administered. That way we can put someone in place who can support the faculty, support the Google Classroom environment, ensure that the communication is better coordinated, uh, maybe handle the more straightforward student queries, um, handle kind of technical issues. So for instance, earlier today, we had a lot of questions about being able to access the assignments and things like that. So we will, we will put in place, I am in the, yeah, so we will hopefully finalize a more detailed financial model during June, but we will make that very clear up front. But there should be minimal overhead per, per, per institution in, in terms of administration. So some of the other topics that we had, um, I don't know if there's anything else we need to say about the positioning, marketing, and, re and the recruitment process. I, I know Philip has already touched on that by saying that it's actually a plus, and I would agree with that, that you're getting a diversity of views. So I don't know if anyone would like to maybe go there or, or maybe also the course content, because that kind of relates to the positioning. Yeah, Sheila. 
just a, a quick one on the, 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 the marketing and student recruitment. And I think this touches on what John Knight said a little earlier. We needed more time. So I think that's another learning from the pilot to have the, the structure and the, the cohort fairly finalized and the structure of the course finalized quite considerably in advance so that it can be marketed more clearly. And so I think that would be important for any group putting it together. Yeah, just to add on the marketing, for the benefit of those who are just joining us, we took a fairly emergent approach where we, we came up with a sort of a very simple common brochure which uh, then each institution was able to adapt for their own purposes. I think that worked fairly well. So we, in general, tried not to be too top down, except where we needed some common information. And yeah, so I, I think that was helpful to have that. My, my question is, when is the next module envisioned to, to start? So when is this ending or has it ended? And when do we start with the new one? For discussion. <laughs> Here's a provisional timeline. So firstly, the, the previous intake is just ending now. In fact, we're busy assessing the group projects and the students are completing their kind of exit survey by Saturday. So we're basically now concluding the, the, the course. Looking ahead, the, the institutions that have been contributing to the pilot are, yeah, the, the majority of them are very much interested in, in continuing or doing this again. So. We thought it might look as follows. I should have swapped these dates around, my apologies. But working back from a Q1 next year, we thought we need to finalize reg registration and enrollment by, let's say, January, have the learning systems and the content in place. Around November, probably have some sort of rehearsal or alignment session, session across the components to look at the more interactive components, to look at the group project administration, etc. We'd like to have marketing material in place by September. For instance, if we need to revisit the, the positioning, let's say we need to change the title or change some of the course component descriptions, which means that we need to have an indication in the tune of, of the various components that will be involved. And as I said, have the financial model agreed. So we, we looking at, at early next year to, uh, to have this run again. Dima, however, having said that, we've now gone through the process of learning quite a bit about what it takes. If Sharjah and QUT and Javiskala and Ishte and Stellenbosch, for instance, says we're interested in doing this as well, and there may be others because I know the GLI partners will, once, once we share some of what's happening here more widely, there will be more. If you say you're interested in doing this as well, then by all means, we can get another stream going. And I think what was fortuitous in this pilot round is that I think Jeff said this, none of the institutions were pigeonholed into having present a particular topic. It so happened that CSU said we have an interest in capability and supply chain and LMU wanted to look at an industry perspective through for, for entertainment and, and, and Kemi Business School at, at accounting and, and insurance and so they so that it made a complementary package. I think if if we have additional kind of contributors you may bring different perspectives and content and we can certainly look at at, at crafting something around that as well. So I don't know if there are any, any reflections from the others on that. Yeah, just to jump in, we, we had initially thought that the, a second pilot might run in the second half of this year. My feeling is that we're already too late for that. 
just given our experience of how long it takes to develop, coordinate, and especially market the program. So that's one thing to consider. The other thing is whether any of the institutions that have been in this one should be in a, a second pilot to pass on some of that experience. And I know John, and, and I agree, feels that you will reinvent the wheel a little bit if that doesn't happen. And we've said that as Antwerp, we probably would be able to participate in a second one. But then there's also is a numbers question. I think if there are only four institutions that want to do another pilot, that may be too few. Although, as you say, John, maybe you get more. On the other hand, I think if we are thinking about more institutions joining this one, then that may be too many. I, I think that eight was it was originally going to be eight, I ended up as seven, which was a fairly sweet spot. I think it was about as the right size. So those are all questions up for discussion, really. I guess one of yeah. the one of the basic questions is: Are there enough <coughs> other institutions who did not uh, participate this time to bring together a new pilot? I think that's one fundamental question. And then the other fundamental question is: Is there is is the one or possibly two institutions that have something different to add to the current list mm -hmm. for when we go ahead with a more commercial oriented session that uh, John's just described for uh, February next year. Yep. One, one, one thing I wanted to share with you, from LMU's perspective, we wanted to have a process that enabled us to collaborate in a kind of project or programmatic way with other GRLI participants. And so we were trying to figure out how to do that. Secondly, we really saw the benefit of bringing global students together in some mechanism. And so then, and that was the key benefit that we saw in terms of the student experience, the schedule was really, if I remember this correctly, it was aligned around the Travis, the quarter semester schedule for Colorado State that put it at a March to May frame. And that doesn't fit LMU's semester schedule. So we put it on top of our current semester schedule, but we're actually giving it as summer session credits because of how the timing overlapped. So we were working institutionally to be really creative about how we kind of frame this and manage it. So anyway, those are some of the drivers in terms of the specific schedule that John just laid out, but those aren't givens depending how we learn from this pilot and move that forward. Yeah, you know, it's just, uh, I think for the exec ed folks, it's easier to move things around, perhaps. But for those institutions, and this is a recap, but it's also a forward looking. If entities are going to have four credit, then where it fits in a semester, in an eight week, we do eight week classes within a 16 week semester for our grad program. So we try to align it with that. Although I will say to Jeff's point, we actually started these during our spring break. So it really, ours really overlapped in eight weeks. It really was 10 weeks covering an eight week semester. So our students, that took a little bit of communication to get them ready two weeks earlier. So I, I think that is just one of one of many logistical challenges that we were able to overcome as best as possible, but people need to understand how we align that is, is something to be aware of. Um, I see Otti's got his hand up. Otti, maybe just before you, 
on news there. It will be interesting to hear Dima and Patricia and also Lisa on the phone. From your perspective, institutions, if you were to engage in something like this, where and when it might fit into your schedule and what it is that you might be interested in contributing, because I think that kind of provides the starting point for thinking about either enlarging the current group or kicking off a separate uh, and parallel stream. So let me maybe just leave that thought. Otti, please go ahead. Oh, please go. If you want to conclude the round first, I will wait, because I think you're still in the scheduling. I have a different question. So please go ahead with the scheduling question. Okay, do you want to put your uh, question in, in the chat uh, and, and, uh, and then we can and we make sure that we don't miss that? Uh, Lisa. John, this is Lisa. Can I? Yeah, sorry. I'm sorry. I, I just, I have a lot of things. I think this sounds really great. I do wonder whether or not there would be any appetite for making this available to undergraduates. Because I think that some really strong seniors aren't really that too far away from the first semester master's students. And so I would just submit that perhaps that's something that we could consider. And in terms of what Mason can contribute I think something around stakeholder value creation or how to measure stakeholder value would be something that we would be interested in. And then depending on whether it's graduate or undergraduate, we could make eight week modules work or a semester schedule work. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Sheila, did you, do you wanna to respond to that before we hear from, okay? Yeah, just briefly, I think I, I do think the topic is really important to undergrads, but I think it, what worked in the classroom was the fact that everyone already had a degree and most people already had work experience. And when you're having exec ed in the room, I think it, it certainly worked well that there was a, everyone had a level eight qualification, everyone already had a degree, it made it more complete. So I'm not sure how it would work with undergrads. Certainly when we were recruiting students, we were fairly strong on ensuring they were qualified to that level to engage in discussions at that level, like yeah. MBA students and like other exec ed. And I think it would be, I, I'm not saying you're right, of course, there is a need for something like this at undergrad, but I think it would be a parallel thing rather than in the same room. Okay, so thanks, Sheila. Uh, Dima? Yeah. Uh, I, we're very flexible in terms of the offering the timing because we, we plan to offer this as exec ad. So we're as a first step. So we're not limited in terms of when this can be offered. But uh, as far as our contribution, I think more along the lines of the role of business schools in promoting sustainability, you know, and being cha champions of a real change in terms of... Uh, thinking and practicing sustainability something along this this line this line i would imagine because everything else has been covered this is quite a, of a comprehensive offering so we need to find a niche something that hasn't been uh, covered i'll give this more thought but this is like my initial uh, comment on it thanks from Patricia. our yeah from our end uh, i think would be actually also pretty flexible as well, uh, anywhere from February to May in between these months would be, uh, and I think this is aligned with what you were uh, thinking that would work uh, also for us. I cannot speak for my colleagues here, uh, the others that are not uh, in the meeting in terms of their, uh, of the topics that they could cover, but somewhere anything in the lines of leadership for sustainability, that's something that we could cover. But also, I, th I know that my colleagues would also jump in with some other topics, but I'm, gonna, I'm not going to speak for them because I don't really know. So uh, that's it from our end. Thanks. Thanks, Patricia. OK, let's maybe go back to Otti just to hear whether he's got some inspirational questions or provocative thoughts that will... You, you know me already, John, as always. I know, I know. I will, and I was just about writing it up in the chat. but. And it might not be for this session, but of course, hey, I love what, what is happening. I, I, I haven't seen lots of successful collaborations across academia, so to speak, to actually build something and deliver, deliver something together. So I think this is 
absolutely brilliant and a big compliment for everybody who's contributed, I think. But then I want to take a little bit the associate perspective on, on three things, maybe. Of course, what our core intention is to build responsible leadership and ideally see positive change as a result. And here I'm wondering, on the content, it seems to be emergent. And I wonder whether there's a, also an emergent perspective on what are the most relevant, what are the minimum modules or content areas that have to be covered, and what's the necessary degree of cohesion in terms of the developmental theory, so to speak, but also in regards to actually delivering the content. That's one, so on the content. On the didactics, I wonder whether there's the same discussion about what is the learning process that is most appropriate to achieving the results. So here about group work, and I think there was a very interesting comment on the degree of engagement of the participants, and maybe more than outcome of the group project, it's actually about the learning throughout people collaborating with others, et cetera, that what, what we want to capture. So again, I wonder what are the emergent didactics on how people change towards responsible leadership that can be stimulated through this course? And then finally, just a, su a suggestion from being a COO, of course, when we were doing these projects, and very often we were, we were aiming for 70, 20, 10, which means 70% uh, total standard, people reuse the modules that are available throughout, 20% gets configured, people can tailor to a standard module in a way that uh, reflects their context, and 10% personalized. We, over many decades, we found that was a formula maybe that would be very useful to get towards in terms of efficiency and effectiveness of the process. So I've just throw this in there in regards to maybe some, again, provocative stimulation, but in a, in a constructive fashion. Thank you. Thank you very much, Otti, and uh, always welcome. Um, so thanks, thanks for those, those suggestions. I don't know if anyone wants to maybe respond to those. I think the, the, the Otti touches on some, some interesting points. And I must be honest, I've thought along the same lines. Do we at some point sit down and, and figure out what is, what is core and what is peripheral? Not that I think anything is less important than anything else, but just in terms of a minimum viable product versus something that's perhaps got some additional value add to it. Okay, I see there are more comments coming into the chat about, about dates. I've, I, I, I suspect we've somehow covered or touched on the majority of the points for reflection. I was wondering if I could perhaps, unless there's any kind of immediate further thoughts to build on what's just been said, maybe nudge us towards what are the underlying principles that we think are, needs to be in place in order for this to work going forward and that will also be useful for forming potential additional pods or coalitions it's very much open at this point um, but i would like to get to a point where we've got a hopefully a few kind of guiding principles as well that we know we can take forward I'd like to just mention one thing that I think has uh, <clears throat> perhaps not been covered sufficiently, and that is the way that each entity or each institution has worked together. I was I was listening into the uh, the session that you ran yesterday on courageous conversations and listening to that uh, the woman the leader of the ex rebellion. And she was talking about how their problems were not about what needed to be done, but how they actually came together and that how their individual personalities and so on and so forth tended to get in the way of what they really wanted to do. And I really feel from an observation point of view, because it was more Danielle than me that was involved in this, that the way that each person involved from each institution has collaborated, has been exceptional at an exceptional standard where nobody has let their egos get in the way at all. So I would just like to note that I think the way people have worked together has been exemplary. Yeah, it's been actually quite a pleasure to uh, have this little peer group, I would say. I, I just wanted to add one, I don't know if it's getting into principles, uh, John, but I really liked the emergent quality of what we created. 
and the fact that we didn't sit down at the beginning and say, okay, these are the subjects that have to be covered. And uh, now who, who can teach that? I, I think it works because people come with where they have expertise and it ends up with a unique combination of courses. And then it, if they look interesting enough, then we test and see if the market is there. I do think maybe there might be, if a parallel pilot runs uh, or a second stream, we might at some point say, okay, what's emerged from that group as a group of topics? Also to Dima's point, right? She doesn't have to, they could set up their own set of topics so that they don't feel they're competing with this one. But we may mix and match a little bit. We may say, well, maybe mine fits in better with that group of topics. But I wouldn't want to take a very top-down approach. Yeah. Yeah, I'd just like to echo that because I think we're all teaching to our passion. I think that's what makes the thing strong. And I think the students responded to that. So I, I think we need to be careful not to break that in, in, in looking for a kind of a spread. Any others? Maybe, maybe communication is a lesson we've learned. Uh, I'm not sure if the principal, but, but clarity like and consistency in communication, I think that would be largely addressed by having more support, more yeah. resources at, on the GRLI su side for support. It's, it, it's not that, that GRLI weren't as supportive as they could have been, but with yeah. more resource coming from this to provide more consistent, like an, one, a one-stop interface for students. And that's mm. the thing because that would really help. And that's something that needs resourcing. Yeah. And I, yeah, I, I, I think, uh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, Travis. I was just a couple words, John North, when you met, when you asked this question. So collaboration, I think it was phenomenal what other people have mentioned that everybody was willing to, to put their egos aside, do some work that probably at their home institution they don't have to do all the time. So I thought that was great. I think this is where higher ed needs to go, quite frankly, right? This international collaboration, bringing the best from your institution, letting another institution bring the best and the students really benefit. And then the other one is coordination. I think we did as well as we could with this first go around. And so I think we ought to recognize that we're hitting on all the things that were a challenge. What we pulled off is pretty impressive, but we learned there needs to be some coordination assistance. And I think John North and John Knights have a plan to make that happen. And I just want to reinforce the global piece. And we committed to bringing students together in some form and we knew that it was going to be complicated from a time zone standpoint, and there might be stresses and strains related to that. But that was, we figured, a part of what the current business landscape is for global companies anyway. And secondly, the benefit of the global outweighs the stresses. As this grows and develops, there's been some discussion about kind of time zone alignment and trying to deal with some of the uh, stresses a, a regional coordination standpoint, and then I'm worried about the unintended consequences of impacting the global piece. And that's just something that we'll need to continue to navigate through. But from my standpoint, the global was a profound dimension of this that was of great benefit. I, I just wanted to follow up with what Wayne and Sheila said. I think, I think the students did not get a course which was Sustainability 101. It was, a, it was actually a very cutting edge set of modules actually. And I think it's because of what Sheila said, it's because we were all passionate about what we were actually teaching. Uh, and that came through, the students got a lot of value added, I think. I mean, after my course, I got one email from one student who said that she completely had changed her mind about the way to approach sustainability. So I think, what we put together here was a set of modules because they were not pre-designed a set of modules that were actually very cutting edge and, and i think that was one of the successes of the programs in many ways
Okay, so I'm hearing, and I'm taking some notes there as well. Appreciation for the deep collaboration, which um, I often misquote the title of your book, John, right? We worked beyond the logo. I think that was a key bit. The emergent nature of it, Wayne, as you pointed out. Teaching to our passion, I think, Sheila, I think that kind of stood out. Then the, the consistency, capacity, and clarity for communication that is needed, which we think is a non-negotiable. Jeff, you pointed to the value of a global experience. Uh, Richard, what, what I heard from you, I'm paraphrasing, but it's, it's beyond sustainability. Um, any, if there's anything else, let's um, absolutely let's, let's, let's hear that, including maybe things that we should avoid. I can also just quickly put on the screen, uh, for those of you that, that, that don't have it open, on slide five of what we sent out, Jeff and I, well, it was mainly Jeff, um, highlighted a few things that we thought were interesting and important. Uh, the first one being a consistent commitment to process, which included ongoing regular meetings, at first bi-weekly and then weekly during delivery, the discipline of setting up agendas and keeping minutes and recording our discussions, this deeply collaborative approach we, we mentioned. Okay, we've touched on, the, on that. The fact that we didn't have to integrate the core operations or financial processes of seven different institutions, but that the GLI could act as the glue between the different institutions, which I think made it a lot easier to get this off the ground, whether it's GDPR or a slightly inadequate Google Classroom experience, but nonetheless, we touched on the shared brochure. I just might mention here of us having lost QUT early on due to the time zone, and obviously we also had some setbacks at, at Sassim, which was unfortunate. The fact that no one was pigeonholed into offering a specific topic we've covered. All institutions saw this as an opportunity to experiment and to learn something. And I think this made it work. All the participants agreed to offer their components regardless of how many students they enrolled in, 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 the, in this first instance. Now, our assumption was that we would have each bring a minimum of five students, i.e. form a cohort of 35, my assumption is that we still feel that a, a group of somewhere between 30 and maybe a maximum of 50 students is probably a good sweet spot. Is, would, would that be fair to say? Yeah. Okay. So that we, do we, because we did at some point think, do we record the sessions, really scale it, get 2,000 students? But it seems like that's not the direction that we're going here. We're rather going in the direction of, of keeping it to a, to a a, a human-sized cohort and then of course did the pilot meet the financial requirements to remain sustainable and you each have to answer that for yourselves uh, because you'll know whether you made a loss or not i know that the gli is not earning anything from this but i think it was worth every single moment of our time because this is clearly the, the way forward i think travis yeah i just have one minor thing and it's it aligns with the title of what you had on the slide there that you just took down. Yeah. Well, it's, it's fine. Is I think having John North and Jeff sort of coordinate our meetings. So I think having somebody, and they did a fa fabulous job of hurting, hurting all of us into progress. But I think that's a piece that that it, we've not given voice to, but I think has to have voice for the next group that's doing it, whether it's pilot or, or an addition to what we just did next spring, having somebody who is leading the initiative and keeping us all straight, I think was really valuable. And everybody chimed in, everybody on this call, you've heard all of our voices because everybody was really committed and vocal, but we, did have some leaders coordinating us. And so I think that's essential. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I, I echo that. And, and again, you know, thanks to everyone. Jeff, obviously, with everything that you did with regards to chairing and ensuring that we have agendas, but also everyone else stepping up during the course of the time. 
whether it is assigning students to groups like Sheila did or designing surveys, which both Sheila and Travis did at some point. So thank you very much. We have a lot, we have a few more minutes left. I, I want to make sure that, that anything else that needs to be said and that we want to take note of, that we create the opportunity for that. Also, maybe there's some further reflections or questions from Patricia or Dima or Otti or uh, Lisa. Dima? So, no, I'm a bit confused. Why uh, do we not replicate the same offering but have additional components to it rather than start another pilot altogether? So this would be my question. I have the same question. So I think that's a good one. Why wouldn't we add to it and make it so that different institutions could select and choose and package how it works for them? Because clearly from what we hear today, it was a great success. So the idea is to leverage what was done and to build on it rather than build something completely from scratch. I think the plan is to not do it from scratch, but I think Jeff had his hand up. So, Yeah, yeah the only thing I would say, we and it's picking up on the word emergent. So we were piloting an idea, a process, a collaboration. We created a model that has the successes and the opportunities for improvement that we've described. But because it's a pilot, we also thought maybe other institutions would come together and pilot a different creative process with a different set of outputs. And maybe that pilot would inform this pilot. So it's part of how we learn to collaborate together. Now it could be the case that the next groups would say, we really just want to join and replicate, and that could be another decision, it seems to me. But the reason why we left that space was around the creativity of pilot, piloting and iterating our experiences. And there's also an issue of numbers. So obviously, like, it would be great if a few more join in and it's still manageable for everybody. Or if not, it, just, it depends on how many people want to to run this whether it's one or two basically if, oh. if, if you had 10 institutes who wanted to join in i don't think you know that we'd probably be getting to too many total modules so i think the somewhere i don't think we've discussed it but there's probably an ideal maximum number of modules yeah um, unless unless you allow some your students to choose Right. Yeah. And, yeah, and then there's still, John Knights, there still is a maximum. You can't have 50 and choose six, right? That's unwieldy. But you could have 10 or yeah. 11 and yeah. choose six. So I think there is some flexibility. But you're right. There probably is above some threshold. It becomes a separate, a separate initiative. Yeah. And, 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 go ahead. No, sorry, I was just going to say it's definitely not the idea of building from scratch. That's the logic behind this call is that, that there's no reinvention. Like we've been through the pilot, we've sorted out a gazillion things, that those are sorted out, whether people join a cohort with this group or whether some of this group splits with another few institutions to form a different cohort, just depends on what interest there is for next year, that's all. Yeah, and if it wasn't clear, I think this group has all expressed, or at least most, want to do it again, but probably can't do it in the fall can't, because th there was a lot of work. And I want to make sure that's clear that I, I think all of the, I can speak for our institution. We loved it. We definitely want to do it again, but we're not ready to do it again in the fall because we need to take a breath and do it again next spring. And so I think what John North was exploring was, is there, and what others have mentioned, is there a group that wants to run it again in the fall to pilot it and then see maybe another group does it again in the spring? So that, that's to the question that was raised by Lisa, I think that's part of what is happening here. Let me try to see if I understand. So what's expected from us if we want to uh, 
um, join the initiative? Is it that we provide participants for something that already exists? And or is it also, uh, or do you want us and you expect us to also add in some content and some new uh, topics? Is it either or, or is it? I think it's both from what I understand. It is both. And I think the main question was very nicely articulated. Are we looking to offer this in the fall? And what, which institutions are ready to pitch in if we are to offer this in the fall? This yeah. is like right. how I translate. Okay. The, the, the other question that I had, and because of this kind of maximum limit of uh, like areas of content that you want to, to have, did you consider to have some uh, core parts or modules and then elective ones, or is that not a, at all what was planned? No, okay. I can maybe just add that, that for some institutions, they required students to do a minimum of four, but some would require them to do seven. Am I right in saying that? So no, we, we asked our yeah. students to do like a minimum of four. I think that was the exact ad. And it was assumed that our students would do our module, but otherwise it was they had the choice. Yeah, yeah. same here. We only required four. They were, were required to do ours. If we do it again next spring and there's the same number, six, seven, somewhere in that ballpark, we probably would require all six or seven and make it a two credit class versus a one credit class. But as you recall, there was some flux at that time where we're going to have six, where we're going to have seven. And so I didn't feel comfortable requiring all because we need a certain number of contact hours to make it a four credit. So we were limited in how we had to structure it. Maybe just a, a short summary, sorry, Wayne, just a short summary on, on kind of what we're, what we're offering here. We definitely want to make the circle bigger but we want to make it, we want to do it in a responsible way. So in other words, if we, obviously, if we're going to have 50 different contributing institutions, then the chances of someone taking your module gets really small and it doesn't become feasible. So we don't want anyone to redesign the wheel from scratch. We have some learning and some infrastructure now that can support this. We can either create a completely separate track of which some of the existing institutions can join, or we can look at increasing the number of offers in the spring intake next year. So I think there are a number of options. Obvious kind of next steps for those interested would be to maybe write up something that says, this is what we'd like to bring. We believe we can bring five or more students. Here are the typical outcomes. I can share with you the material that's been provided. But it, th this is really about sharing that learning and saying, how do we take it forward? Wayne, you wanted to add something? And I know we need to wrap up. Yep. Yeah, so we do have a form for that that we used. So that might be useful to use the same form, just saying uh, this is the topic we think we could cover. And these are some a few bullet points and maybe who the contact or the faculty would be. So we just use that same form that will help us. I really think it's then to see where we land. So if we land with another four institutions, it may be manageable to add it into the current cohort uh, and then just figure out the logistics around uh, class size numbers and, and options and so on. If we get eight or 10 institutions really interested, then I think we may have to look at a, a different offering, but perhaps two in parallel. And one thing I would highlight is another commitment is ongoing meetings among us, whoever the us is, as we work through the logistics of the design and the delivery. That's another benefit of this, but it's another work commitment dimension of it as well. Yeah, on, on that, I think maybe in spring, now that we've been through next spring, I was hoping we might... I love talking to you guys, but I was hoping we could possibly have fewer meetings in spring because it's, I'm not sure it's sustainable for us to have meetings every week in spring. I'm on research leave and I'm not sure I can. Yeah. And maybe so with a coordinator, that would be less, yeah. less necessary. 
yeah, it won't be as necessary. And and I've actually got someone um, that's that's starting sooner than the first of June. I know we said we're going to have them starting the first of June, but they actually starting this week. Okay. Excellent. Thank you, everyone. I know. The final, I, I just have one. Time. Sorry, yep. John. I just have one. I know we're a little over time, but I'm looking to Richard here and just wondering how this experience has been, and whether we have enough appetite from let's say asia pacific to also think about that because it's been a stretch to cover this amount of the globe very early for some american colleagues and quite late <laughs> for you richard and of course qut dropped out because of that logistical time zone issue have we where i'm just interested i think it's an it's a question right do we have enough on that side of the globe that we might think about whether it's whether we design it a little bit more time zone friendly for the different institutions. I mean, I, I, I think um, another institution in Asia Pacific would be, be not quite nice if we have, a, have an Australian sort of joiner as well. So QT maybe. Strangely enough, I end up doing I end up doing calls late in the evening, but actually, when I do calls with San Francisco on the other side of the course, I do them early in the morning. So we can sort out the logistics on time zones, I think. And I think you know if if you're in this part of the world running a business with lots of European and American clients, you're used to late calls. To be honest, it's half past nine here at night now. But yeah, look. I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a major problem, Wayne, but uh, it would be nice to have a bit more representation in Asia, I think. Mm -hmm. Okay. Good. Okay. I'm, but it's I'm a nightmare for the Australians. That, that's the problem. It's a nightmare for the Australians. Yeah. Because Sydney is now midnight, right? Mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's the problem. We've had We've had Deacon just join us as an associate partner as well. So we now have De Deacon, QUT. We continue to make contact with uh, Latrobe. We still we have Griffith as an associate partner. We've got a number of Australian associates and partners. And of course, we have some other institutions in your region as well, Richard, that we can reach out to. So maybe we can look at forming a geographical cluster around that. Let me get back to you on that. Do we have partners in Singapore? Uh, no, but we've got contacts with potential partners. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so maybe I can look into that. Okay. I'm going to stick around for a bit more. I know most of you need to, need to dash, but if there are any other questions or thoughts or suggestions, please feel free to continue. I, I thank everyone for contributing your time. We'll reset, uh, Sheila, I think maybe start off with, with bi-weekly. Um, and obviously once we've got someone on board that can help coordinate, it won't be as, uh, it won't be as frequent. So we'll take that on board. And uh, yeah, all, all the best and well done. So is there anything operationally, just for those that are still around that we need to talk about in terms of what's been happening over the last 24 hours, because I know there were a lot of emails about accessing videos. Anything else? You're on mute. Yeah. I'm on, of course I'm on mute. Just very quickly, I assume, are we meeting next week, the cohort who are currently delivering? Because I thought maybe we might discuss a little of the financial matter. Then I was playing around with John's spreadsheet, which is terrific. And came up with a couple of different scenarios that might be useful to inform things. So we, we, if we were, we whenever we next meet, next week or the week after. We June might, 2nd is our next scheduled meeting. June 2nd, so maybe I can we can look at that yeah. then if that's okay, because it was just real helpful. It's a great little spreadsheet, John. Um, I'll talk to you later. Great, thank you very much. So June 2nd, we're on, thank you. I think one of the th one of the things that's uh, probably really important is that if this group is going to be extended, that we get finalization on who that's going to be mm. pretty soon by yeah. the end of June. Otherwise, 
it'll just delay everything. Yeah. So I think if we have, if we have our two June meeting, which gives us more clarity on the financial model, we ask Dima, Patricia, Alisa and others to submit their kind of description of what they might want to contribute so that we can see how that fits into the overall, which kind of takes us to the end of June with a financial model and component descriptions. If we end up having three additional modules, my, my sense is that it, it, it won't necessarily be, it won't distract. I think it, could, it, can, it can still work. I think it's when it goes over maybe 10 that it's going to, that it's going to start getting difficult. What could also happen is it may be that some of you say we'd be happy to form part of a of two clusters. We have we maybe have an Asia Pacific cluster and a North America Europe cluster or something along those lines. But you your topic is something that you feel you can deliver at both in both instances. We may end up having three or four kind of shared components that sits across clusters. So that might be the way of scaling this so that eventually we actually have parallel groups running. And those that are becoming more experienced at delivering this kind of pops in and delivers their component in, at diff in different uh, uh, clusters or intakes. Yeah. I'm thinking of leadership, for instance, as, a, as one topic. Sorry, Wayne. No, I, I think it's a good discussion. I just wanted to say if you can stay behind, John, I just have a, an unrelated question for you. Mm -hmm. yeah. Sorry, I had a, yeah. sorry, 